things that were okay in our city, home, and all in our home, and things that were okay in our city, home, and all in our home, and things that were okay in our city, home. Okay, welcome. After a short absence, welcome to today's reading of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, today, as so called. Uh, today I will read the first four chapters of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the English title of The Great Liberation by Hearing in the Intermediate States, the Bardo Todo, revealed by Turton Karma Lingpa and attributed to the great Guru Padma Sambhav, and of course the mantra with which I begin each every one of these uh, sessions is in fact an invocation of Padma Sambhav, who is by virtue of that mantra spiritually present here and now. Padma Sambhav was, of course, the great tantric adept, widely uh, renowned as a second Buddha, who is credited with converting Tibet uh, to Buddhism in the 8th century. <coughs> That's the 8th century of the common era, of course. Padma Sambhav himself was not Tibetan, but originated in a quasi-mystical land uh, called Odayana. Some people identify Odayana with the Swat Valley in western Pakistan near the Afghanistan border, but others identify it with a place in eastern India. And the, um, the great scholar Herbert Gunther, who has translated the only uh, authentic translation of Padmasambhav's, some of Padmasambhav's original writings uh, in his book, The Teachings of Padmasambhav, suggests in the in introduction to that book that the identification of Odiana with the Swat Valley has no basis. Possibly he uh, advocates the uh, Indi Eastern Indian theory, although he doesn't say so. <coughs> in any case, born in 1326, about 500 years after Padma Sambhav, Turton Karma Lingpa, uh, Link, sorry, Turton Karma Lingpa uh, was the son of Nida Sangye and was recognized as the reincarnation of Chokro Lu Gyaltsen, a disciple of Padma Sambhav. According to the tradition, Karma Lingpa founded, found the buried texts of the Bardo Todo at the summit of Mount uh, Gampudar in Tibet, I'm assuming. This is therefore a terma, a hidden treasure or found text in the Dzogchen tradition of Padmasambhav. Today I will be reading the first four chapters of the Penguin edition translated by, uh, by Gurme Dorji. And these are, uh, first, the natural liberation of the nature of mind, the four session yoga of the preliminary practice. Those of you who attended my talk on Nyandro uh, a few months ago uh, will recognize this text as a Nyandro, a preliminary set of practices uh, conventionally performed 111, uh, 111 times, consisting of taking refuge, generating an altruistic intention or bodhicitta, reciting the hundred-syllable mantra of Vajrasattva, offering the mandala and guru yoga. This is followed by a prayer for union with the spiritual teacher entitled Natural Liberation Without Renunciation of the Three Poisons. And this is followed by the root verses of the six intermediate states. Finally, I will read the introduction to awareness, natural liberation through naked perception, which is a Dzogchen pointing out instruction. The pointing out instruction... Um, or transmission, it is a transmission, it's a tantric transmission, is conventionally given to advanced adepts of the Nyingma nine-stage practice of spiritual development, although Dzogchen is, is also practiced in the other schools of uh, Tibetan Buddhism. It is particularly associated with the Nyingma. And after the, uh, the, uh, after the fulfillment of extensive uh, preliminary practices, but this is not always the case, Gampapa in particular uh, gave the pointing out instruction in, to mass audiences in the first half of the 12th century, much like the Dalai Lama does today with respect to the uh, Kala Chakra. The, this actually seems to be more in keeping with the original spirit of Dzogchen itself, which, like Chan, appears to eschew the gradual path, uh, which, of course, is the dominant uh, orthodoxy in Tibetan organizationalism. The re this reading is being presented as a meritorious act. It is not a, uh, a talk as such uh, or, or a discussion, although we can have a discussion afterwards. Uh, very similar if you attended my ser um, series of uh, readings of the Lotus Sutra last summer, which we did over nine sessions, again, uh, as meritorious acts. 
and will therefore be presented continuously and without interruption, so I will not be taking questions during the course of the reading, uh, which will probably take about an hour and a half, and then we can have an open discussion after, of course, the dedication of merit. And I may or may not be able to stay for the discussion, as I am expecting a guest here in RL, uh, but I'm not sure when they're going to show up, so I will if I can. In addition, each chapter begins with a brief introduction, which is not part of the text, but was added by the translator to provide context. They're very short and they're very handy, so I am going to read them um, as an introduction to the text, which I will then add read as well. So these, these first, uh, in each, for each chapter, the first, I'll, I'll let you know, I'll just, I'll tell you somehow that, that when the actual text begins. So let's begin then with chapter one, the natural liberation of the nature of mind, the four session yoga of the preliminary practice. And the translators, uh, first of all, I'm assuming everyone can hear me. Of course, it's ridiculous of me to ask, isn't it, in voice, because if you can't hear, you won't hear me asking. Okay, so let's begin then. Chapter 1, The Natural Liberation of the Nature of Mind, the Four Session Yoga of the Preliminary Practice of the Bardo Toto. Uh, the context, written by the translator, states, In its original Tibetan, this preliminary practice is beautifully written and in verse. In the monasteries and lay households of the practitioners of this cycle of teachings, it is usually sung melodically in the early morning, before any other practice or activity is begun. Often the young monks sing the opening verses of this poem as they go about their morning duties. When engaging in a preliminary retreat, it is recommended that this meditation is done every day in four sessions, early morning till dawn, after sunrise until just before noon, uh, from afternoon until just before sunset, and from sunset until late evening. The practice essentializes the four common or outer preliminaries and the five uncommon or inner preliminaries which are described in the glossary. It is recommended that the inner preliminary practices are repeated 100,000 times. You hear, you find different numbers, 100,000, 108,000, 111,000, 111 are the ones you hear most often. As a prerequisite to receiving instruction on the generation stage practices of the vehicle of indestructible reality, the Vajrayana. So this first chapter in itself is in Yandro, it's a practice in its own right. So, he, and here it begins. Herein is contained the natural liberation of the nature of mind, the four session yoga, which is a spiritual practice of the vehicle of indestructible reality, the way of secret mantras, an extract from the peaceful and wrathful deities, a profound sacred teaching entitled natural liberation through recognition of enlightened intention. It would be excellent if one were to train one's mental continuum according to the following preliminary practices, which are based on the peaceful and wrathful deities of a profound sacred teaching entitled Natural Liberation Through Recognition of Enlightened Intention. The Common Preliminary Practice. Oh, alas, alas, fortunate child of Buddha nature, do not be oppressed by the forces of ignorance and delusion. But rise up now with resolve and courage. Entranced by ignorance from beginningless time until now, you have had more than enough time to sleep. So do not slumber any longer, but strive after virtue with body, speech, and mind. Are you oblivious to the sufferings of birth, old age, sickness, and death? There is no guarantee that you will survive even past this very day. The time has come for you to develop perseverance in your practice. For, at this singular opportunity, you could attain the everlasting bliss of nirvana. So now is certainly not the time to sit idly, but starting with the reflection on death, you should bring your practice to completion. The moments of our life are not expendable, and the possible circumstances of death are beyond imagination. If you do not achieve an undaunted confidence security now, what point is there in your being alive, O living creature? All phenomena are ultimately selfless, empty, and free from conceptual elaboration. In their dynamic, they resemble an illusion, mirage, dream, or reflected image, a celestial city, an echo, a reflection of the moon and water, 
a bubble, an optical illusion, or an intangible emanation. You should know that all things of cyclic existence and nirvana accord in nature with these ten similes of illusory phenomena. All phenomena are naturally uncreated. They neither abide nor cease, neither come nor go. They are without objective referent, signless, ineffable, and free from thought. The time has come for this truth to be realized. Homage to the spiritual teachers. Homage to the meditational deities. Homage to the Dakinis. Oh, alas, alas, how needing of compassion are those living beings tortured by their past actions, who are drowning in this deep chasm, the engulfing ocean of their past actions. Such is the nature of fluctuating cyclic existence. Grant your blessing, so that this ocean of sufferings may run dry. How needing of compassion are those who are skillless, those who are tortured by ignorance and past actions, those who indulge in actions conducive to suffering, even though they desire happiness. Grant your blessing so that the obscuration of dissonant mental states and past actions may be purified. How needing of compassion are the ignorant and the deluded, bound in this confining dungeon of egotistical attachment and the subject-object dichotomy, who, like wild game, are trapped in this snare time after time, Grant your blessing so that cyclic existence may be stirred to its depths. How needing of compassion are those beings who endlessly revolve in the cycle of existence, as if circling perpetually on the rim of a water wheel in this six-dimensional city of imprisoning past actions. Grant your blessing so that the womb entrances to the six classes of existence may be barred. We who are fearless and hard-hearted, despite having seen so many sufferings of birth, old age, sickness, and death, are wasting our human lives, endowed with freedom and opportunity, on the paths of distraction. Grant your blessing so that we may continuously remember impermanence and death. Since we do not recognize that impermanent things are unreliable, still even now we remain attached, clinging to the cycle of existence. Wishing for happiness, we pass our human lives in suffering, Grant your blessing, so that attachment to cyclic existence may be reversed. Our impermanent environment will be destroyed by fire and water. The impermanent sentient beings within it will endure the severing of body and mind. The seasons of the year, summer, winter, autumn, and spring, themselves exemplify impermanence. Grant your blessing, so that disillusionment with conditioned existence may arise from the depths of our hearts. Last year, this year, the waxing and waning moons, the days, nights, and indivisible time moments are all impermanent. If we reflect carefully, we too are face to face with death. Grant your blessing so that we may become resolute in our practice. Though this body endowed with freedom and opportunity is hard, extremely hard to find, when the Lord of Death approaches in the semblance of disease, how needing of compassion are those who, bereft of the sacred teachings, return empty-handed from this life. Grant your blessing so that a recognition of urgency may grow in our minds. Alas, alas, O oh precious jewel, embodiment of compassion, since you, the conqueror, are endowed with a loving heart, grant your blessing so that we and the six classes of beings may be liberated right now from the sufferings of cyclic existence. The Uncommon Preliminary Practice Refuge Then, the outer, inner, and secret refuges should be adopted in the following way. Outer Refuge I bow down to and take refuge in the spiritual teachers whose enlightened intention throughout the past, present, and future is uninterruptedly directed towards living beings, the in infinite sentient beings of the three world systems and six classes. I bow down to and take refuge in the perfect Buddhas, the transcendent ones gone to bliss of the ten directions and four times, foremost of humankind, adorned by the major and minor marks, whose enlightened activities are inexhaustible and as vast as space. I bow down to and take refuge in the sacred teachings, including the doctrines of the ultimate truth, quiescent and desireless, the irreversible path of the three vehicles, and the transmissions, esoteric instructions and treatises of the transmitted precepts and treasures.
I bow down to and take refuge in the communities of monks and nuns who abide on the unerring path, forming a field of all supreme merits, together with the assembly of sublime ones set apart from the stains of dissonant mental states and the supreme upholders of the teaching, bodhisattvas, pious attendants, and hermit Buddhas. Inner Refuge I bow down to and take refuge in the spiritual teachers embodying the essential nature of the Buddhas of the three times, the masters of all the secret and unsurpassed mandalas who guide all living beings with their blessings and compassion. I bow down to and take refuge in the meditational deities who, even though they remain unmoving as the Buddha body of reality, uncreated and free from the limits of conceptual elaboration, emanate in peaceful and wrathful forms for the sake of living beings and confer the supreme and common accomplishments. I bow down to and take refuge in the assembly of Dakinis, who, moving with the energy of compassion through the space of reality, grant supreme bliss as they arise from their pure abodes and bestow accomplishments upon those who keep their commitments. Secret Refuge From within a state free from grasping and beyond intellect, I take refuge in the nature of the great expanse of sameness and perfection, a temporal emptiness, free from conceptual elaboration, primordially pure in essence, natural expression, and compassionate energy. From within a state which is non-conceptual, naturally radiant and stark, I take refuge in the primordial embodiment of the five Buddha bodies, spontaneously and naturally present, abiding in the mandala of the unique seminal point, which is the union of expanse and awareness, and of radiance and emptiness, the indestructible chain of inner radiance that is intrinsic awareness. Throughout the three times, beginningless and endless, I take refuge in the compassionate ones, unimpeded, naturally expressive, and all-pervasive, the unimpededly arising and subsiding rays of light which emanate through the expressive power of awareness, dispelling non-conceptually the darkness in the minds of living beings. The generation of an altruistic intention. <clears throat> then, the altruistic intention of the greater vehicle should be generated in the following way. Even though all phenomena are empty and selfless, sentient beings fail to realize this. Alas, how needing of compassion are they? So that all those who are the focus of our compassion may attain enlightenment, I must rouse my body, speech, and mind to the practice of virtue. For the benefit of all sentient beings of the six classes, from now until enlightenment is attained, not just for my own sake, but for the benefit of all, I must generate the mind aspiring to supreme enlightenment. How needing of compassion are those bereft of the sacred teachings who have ensnared themselves within the unfathomable ocean of suffering, so that all those who are the focus of our compassion may be established in happiness, I must generate the mind aspiring to supreme enlightenment. I myself and all infinite sentient beings are primordially of the nature of Buddhahood, so that we may all become supreme embodiments who know this to be so, I must generate the mind aspiring to supreme enlightenment. The ocean of mundane cyclic existence is like an illusion. All compounded things lack permanence. Their essence is empty and selfless. But these naive beings right here who do not realize this to be so, roam through cyclic existence, driven on by the twelve links of dependent origination, so that all beings gripped in this quagmire of name and form may attain Buddhahood, I must rouse my body, speech, and mind to the practice of virtue. I take refuge from now until enlightenment in the Buddha, the sacred teachings, and supreme assembly. Through the merit of practicing generosity and the other perfections, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all living beings. May I become a spiritual teacher able to guide infinite sentient beings, as many as there are, without exception. Then, one should meditate on the four immeasurable aspirations as follows. May all sentient beings be endowed with happiness. May they all be separated from suffering and its causes. May they be endowed with joy, free from suffering. May they abide in equanimity, free from attachment or aversion. 
purification of negativity and obscuration through the repeated recitation of the hundred syllable mantra of Vajra uh, Satwa. This should be done in the context of the following visualization. At the crown of my head, on a lotus moon cushion, is my spiritual teacher resplendent in the form of Vajra Satwa. His body is translucent like crystal, and at his heart, resting on a moon disk, it is a syllable hum, surrounded by the hundred syllable mantra. A stream of nectar then descends through my crown fontanelle, purifying my violations of the commitments, my negativities and obscurations. May Vajrasattva, glorious transcendent one, anoint me at this very moment within the nectar stream of pristine cognition so that the negativities and obscurations of myself and all sentient beings without exception are purified. And follows the hundred syllable mantra of Vajrasattva, which I have not practiced. However, I will try to approximate it in the Sanskrit. Om Vajrasattva Samayamanupalaya Vajrasattva Tweno Patishta Drido me bhava, suposho me bhava, sutosho me bhava, anurakto me bhava, sarva siddhing me prayacha, sarva karmasu cha me chitang, shreya kuru hung, ha 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 ho, bhagavan sarva tatagata, vajra ma me muncha, vajra bhava, Mahasama Yasatwa Ah. Owing to my ignorance, delusion, and confusion, I have transgressed the boundaries of the commitments which I should have guarded. O oh, my protector and spiritual teacher, be my refuge. You who are the supreme and glorious Vajra holder, embodying great compassion and love, O oh, foremost of beings, be our refuge. Assist us to purify and cleanse, without exception, the mass of flaws, our negativities, obscurations, transgressions, and downfalls. By this virtuous activity, may I swiftly attain the state of Vajrasattva, now, and may all sentient beings, without exception, be swiftly established at that same state. May we become exactly like you, Vajrasattva, exactly resembling you in body, retinue, lifespan, fields, and in your supreme and exquisite major marks. The Mandala Offering Then present the Mandala of Offerings in the following way. Om Vajra Bhumi Ahong The base transforms into a powerful ground of gold. Om Vajra Reke Ahung. The outer periphery becomes a jeweled fence of iron mountains, and at the center is Mount Sumeru, king of mountains, majestic and formed from the pr five precious substances, exquisitely beautiful in shape and delightful to behold, encircled by seven concentric golden mountain ranges and seven intervening emanational oceans. To the east is the continent of uh, Viradeha, and to the south is Jambudvipa. The west is adorned by Aparagodaniya, and to the north is Uttarakuru. To either side of these continents are the eight subcontinents, Deha and Videha to the east, Chamara and Aparachamara to the south, Sata and Uttara Mantrina to the west, and Kaurava and Kaurava to the north. I offer this world system along with the sun, moon, Rahu, Ketu, and the luxuriant resources and riches of gods and humans. To you, my precious spiritual teachers, and to your retinues, through your compassion, please accept them for the benefit of all beings. Ong Ah Hong. To my precious spiritual teachers in the fields of the Buddha body of emanation, I offer all the inestimable resources of gods and humans within the immeasurable palace of the animate and inanimate triciliocosm uh, tri in the form of a dense cloud of offerings as numerous as atomic particles together with Mount Sumeru and its continents. Please accept these offerings with compassion and love. May all beings be born into the fields of the Buddha body of emanation. Ong Ah Hung. 
to my precious spiritual teachers of the fields of the Buddha body of perfect resource, I offer this perfect purity of the sensory spectra and sensory activity fields, adorned by the five sense faculties, radiant and brilliant, within the immeasurable palace of the pure energy channels of my body. Please accept these offerings with compassion and love. May all beings be born into the fields of the Buddha body of perfect resource. Oh, ah, hong. To my precious spiritual teachers in the field of the Buddha body of reality, I offer this primordially pure and innate pristine cognition that abides within the immeasurable palace of the pure Buddha body of reality, which is mind's actual nature. Free from an objective referent, empty, radiant, and free from subjective apprehension, please accept these offerings with compassion and love. May all beings be born into the field of the Buddha body of reality. Oh, ah, hung. By offering this exquisite and pleasing mandala, may no obje obstacles arise in the path of enlightenment. May the enlightened intention of those gone to bliss, past, present, and future be realized. May I neither be bewildered in migratory existence, nor lulled by the solitary quiescence of nirvana. But may I liberate being to the expanse of space. O Nga Hung Maha Guru Deva Dakini Ratna Mandala Puja Mega Ah Hung. Prayer to the Lineage Teachers. Then, in order to cultivate union with the spiritual teacher, the prayer to the lineage should be recited as follows. I pray to the direct intentional lineage of the conquerors, to Samantabhadra, primordial lord, Buddha body of reality, to the conqueror Vajradhara, embodiment of the sixth enlightened family, and to Vajrasattva, foremost of guides, the supreme Buddha mind. I pray to the symbolic lineage of the awareness holders, to the awareness holder uh, pra, Prahe Vajra, supreme among emanations, to the spiritual teacher Sri Singha, supreme son of the conquerors, to the undying Padmakara, established in the Buddha body of indestructible reality, and to the Dakini Yeshe Chogyalma, Chogyalma, worthy recipient of the secret mantras. I pray to the oral lineage of authoritative personages, to Karma Lingpa, master of the profound treasures, to the one named Ninda Choji, son, supreme son of his Buddha mind, and to the one named Surya Chandra, which is Ninda Ozer, lord of living beings during this degenerate age. I pray to the assembled deities of the three roots, to all the genuine spiritual teachers of the core lineage who form the connecting links of this transmission, to the peaceful and wrathful meditational deities in whom appearance and emptiness are indivisible, and to the oceanic assembly of Dakinis and oath-bound protectors of the sacred teachings. O oh, you spiritual teachers who uphold the lineage of the oral transmission and train each according to his or her needs, if your teaching were to enter into decline, the yogins of this era would be utterly disheartened. Please, therefore, continue to guide all beings from this swamp of cyclic existence. As we call out to you with mournful and tormented cries, bring to mind now the strict vows which you made in the past. Reveal your faces from the expanse of space endowed with major and minor marks. Please guide all beings from this swamp of cyclic existence. Let your Brahma voice reverberate like a thousand peals of thunder. Open wide the portals to the treasury of your Buddha mind. Pour out the light rays of your discriminative awareness and compassion. Please guide all beings from this swamp of cyclic existence. Liberate now, without exception, all beings of this final era. Anoint us now with the river of the four pure empowerments. Liberate now the four continua bewildered by dissonant mental states. Please guide all beings from this swamp of cyclic existence. Grant now the fruitional attainment of the four Buddha bodies of those gone to bliss. May I become a spiritual teacher able to guide all the infinite sentient beings who have been my parents throughout space without exception. Please guide all beings from this swamp of cyclic existence. Receiving the four empowerments. Then the meditation to be adopted while receiving the four empowerments should be as follows. From the crown of the spiritual teacher in union with consort, a white syllable Ong 
radiating rays of light descends into the midpoint between my eyebrows. The vase empowerment is thus received and the obscurations of the body are purified. Please confer upon me the accomplishments of Buddha body. From the throat of the spiritual teacher in union with consort, a red syllable, ah, radiating rays of light, descends into the sense faculty of my tongue. The secret empowerment is thus received and the obscurations of speech are purified. Please confer upon me the accomplishments of Buddha speech. From the heart of the spiritual teacher in union with consort, a blue syllable, hung, radiating rays of light, descends into the center of my heart. The empowerment of pristine cognition is thus received and the obscurations of mind are purified. Please confer upon me the accomplishments of Buddha mind. From the navel of the spiritual teacher in union with consort, a red syllable, hri, radiating rays of light, descends into the center of my navel. The obscurations which mundanely differentiate between body, speech, and mind are purified, and the fourth empowerment of indivisible, indivisible co-emergence uh, is received. O oh, glorious and precious root spiritual teacher, be indivisibly present, seated on the pistol of a lotus within my heart forever. Through your great kindness, favor me with your acceptance, and please confer upon me the accomplishments of Buddha, body, speech, and mind. May we become exactly like you, glorious spiritual teacher, exactly resembling you in body, retinue, lifespan, fields, and in your supreme and excellent major marks. These verses forming the preliminary practice of the peaceful and wrathful deities, a profound sacred teaching entitled Natural Liberation Through Recognition of Enlightened Intention, may be applied as a supplementary method in the context of mental purification. This spiritual practice of the unsurpassed greater vehicle, Mahayana, is an oral teaching of Ninda Choji Lingpa, the eldest son of the treasure finder Karma Lingpa, and it was committed to writing by a guru, Surya Chandra Rasmi, Rasmi, Surya Chandra Rasmi, that is, Ninda Ozer. Okay, that completes chapter one. I'm going to proceed to chapter two momentarily. However, I would like to replenish my glass of water, if you don't mind. I will return in a few seconds. Chapter two. A prayer for union with the spiritual teacher entitled Natural Liberation Without Renunciation of the Three Poisons. Again, this contextual note written by the translator. This prayer to the spiritual teacher is generally recited immediately after the preliminary practice. It is also recommended that it be recited at the beginning of any ritual or when thinking of the spiritual teacher or whenever the practitioner is about to enter into periods of meditation. Something you'll notice, I'll just comment briefly, something you'll notice about these texts is that it's, although it's referred to as the Tibetan Book of the Dead, it really seems more like a compilation of separate texts rather than uh, a consecutive treatise. A correct perception of the spiritual teacher is considered vital for all practitioners of the vehicle of indestructible reality, Vajrayana. Further, it is considered essential that a practitioner receive spiritual inspiration as transmitted through an unbroken lineage of masters from a living teacher. First, however, before accepting anyone as a spiritual teacher, it is also regarded as essential that the practitioner examine and scrutinize the prospective teacher over a long period of time and accept him or her as a qualified teacher only when it is certain that the person meets the requirements of a spiritual teacher as set out in the authoritative sacred texts. Then, if they are sure that their own motivation is sincere, students should follow the advice of their chosen spiritual teacher with incontrovertible uh, devotion. Ultimately, the inspiration that is requested from the spiritual teacher is coming from the purity of the practitioner's own perception, altruistic intention, and confidence. Here begins the text. Herein is contained a prayer for union with the spiritual teacher, embodiment of the three Buddha bodies entitled Natural Liberation Without Renunciation of the Three Poisons, which is an extract from the Peaceful and Wrathful Deities, a profound sacred teaching 
entitled Natural Liberation Through Recognition of Enlightened Intention. In the palace of reality's expanse, pure and pervasive, is my spiritual teacher, the Buddha body of reality, uncreated and free from conceptual elaboration. To you I pray with fervent devotion. I request the primordially pure self-empowerment, the blessings of the Buddha body of reality, so that naturally arising Christian cognition is uncontrived and spontaneously present. Through natural liberation, without renunciation of ignorance and delusion. In the palace of great bliss, which is pristine cognition, radiant and pure, is my spiritual teacher, the Buddha body, a perfect resource, unimpeded and supremely blissful. To you I pray with fervent devotion, I request the spontaneously present self-empowerment, the blessings of the Buddha body, a perfect resource, so that intrinsic awareness, which is pristine cognition, is naturally liberated in supreme bliss through natural liberation without renunciation of desire and clinging. In the palace of the lotus, untainted and pure, is my spiritual teacher, the Buddha body of emanation, naturally arising in unlimited forms beyond determination. To you I pray with fervent devotion, I request the naturally liberating self-empowerment, the blessings of the Buddha body of emanation, so that intrinsic awareness, which is naturally manifesting pristine cognition, naturally radiates through natural liberation without renunciation of discordant views and aversion. <clears throat> In the palace of intrinsic awareness, the genu genuine inner radiance is my spiritual teacher, the unity of the three Buddha bodies, beyond spatial delineation and supremely blissful. To you I pray with fervent devotion, I request the supremely blissful self-empowerment, the blessings of the three Buddha bodies, so that naturally arising pristine cognition is spontaneously present as the three Buddha bodies, through natural liberation without renunciation of the subject-object dichotomy. How needing of compassion are suffering sentient beings, right here, who are driven on through cyclic existence by delusion and confusion, because they do not understand that their own mind is the Buddha body of reality, free from extremes. May they all actualize the Buddha body of reality. How needing of compassion are mistakenly prejudiced sentient beings right here, who are driven on through cyclic existence by attachment and craving, because they do not understand that their own awareness is the Buddha body of perfect resource, imbued with supreme bliss. May they all actualize the Buddha body of perfect resource. How needing of compassion are sentient beings with discordant views right here, who are driven on through cyclic existence by aversion and dualistic perception, because they do not understand that their own mind is the Buddha body of emanation, arising and subsiding naturally. May they all actualize the Buddha body of emanation. How needing of compassion are all unenlightened living beings right here, who as a result of grasping are obscured by dissonant mental states and subtle, obscuration, uh, subtle obstructions to knowledge, because they do not understand that their own mind is indivisible from the three Buddha bodies, may they all actualize the three Buddha bodies. These verses forming a prayer for union with the spiritual teacher, embodiment of the three Buddha bodies, entitled Natural Liberation Without Renunciation of the Three Poisons, which are an extract from the Peaceful and Wrathful Deities, a profound sacred teaching entitled Natural Liberation Through Recognition of Enlightened Intention, were composed by Padmakara, the preceptor from Odiyana. May the influence of this sacred teaching not be extinguished until cyclic existence has been emptied. This prayer was brought forth from Mount Gampudar, which resembles a dancing god by the accomplished master Karma Lingpa. Chapter 3 Root Verses of the Six Intermediate States Context Note by the Translator According to this cycle of teachings, the circle of birth and death can be seen as being composed of six intermediate states. These six modalities of existence are waking st living state, dreaming, meditation, the time of death, and the two successive phases of the after-death state are defined in the glossary. 
This poem emphasizes the centrally important perspective that relates to each of these states. It is recommended that practitioners should memorize these verses and recite them repeatedly while reflecting on their meaning throughout their lives. And here begins the text. Herein is contained the root verses of the six intermediate states. I bow down to the conquerors, the peaceful and wrathful deities. The root verses concerning the six intermediate states are as follows. Alas, now as the intermediate state of living arises before me, renouncing laziness for which there is no time in this life, I must enter the undistracted path of study, reflection, and meditation. Taking perceptual experience and the nature of mind as the path, I must cultivate actualization of the three Buddha bodies. Now, having obtained a precious, a precious human body this one time, I do not have the luxury of remaining on a distracted path. Alas, now as the intermediate state of dreams arises before me, renouncing the corpse-like insensitive sleep of delusion, I must enter, free from distracting memories, the state of the abiding nature of reality, cultivating the experience of inner radiance through the recognition, emanation, and transformation of dreams. I must not sleep like a beast, but cherish the experiential cultivation which mingles sleep with actual realization. Alas, now as the intermediate state of meditative concentration arises before me, renouncing the mass of distractions and confusions, I must undistractedly enter a state which is devoid of subjective apprehension and free from the two extremes, and obtain stability in the stages of generation and perfection. At this moment, having renounced activity and having attained a singular concentration, I must not fall under the sway of bewildering mental afflictions. Alas, now as the intermediate state of the time of death arises before me, renouncing all attachment, yearning, and subjective apprehension in every respect, I must undistractedly enter the path on which the oral teachings are clearly understood and eject my own awareness into the uncreated expanse of space. Immediately upon separation from this compounded body of flesh and blood, I must know this body to be like a transient illusion. Alas, now as the intermediate state of reality arises before me, renouncing the merest sense of awe, terror, or fear, I must recognize all that arises to be awareness, manifesting naturally of itself, knowing such sounds, lights, and rays to be visionary phenomena of the intermediate state. At this moment, having reached this critical point, I must not fear the assembly of peaceful and wrathful deities which manifest naturally. Alas, now, as the intermediate state of rebirth arises before me, I must, with one-pointed intention, concentrate my mind and resolutely connect with the residual potency of my virtuous past actions. I must obstruct the womb entrance and call to mind the methods of reversal. This is the time when perseverance and purity of perception are imperative. I must give up all jealousy and meditate on my spiritual teacher with consort. From the mouth of the accomplished masters come these words. O oh, you with your mind far away, thinking that a death will not come, entranced by the pointless activities of this life, if you were to return empty-handed now, would not your life's purpose have been utterly confused? Recognize what it is that you truly need. It is a sacred teaching for liberation. So should you not practice this divine sacred teaching, beginning from this very moment? And it is also said, If I choose not to take the oral teachings of the spiritual teacher to heart, am I not a deceiver of myself? This completes the root verses of the six intermediate states. Finally, we conclude with chapter four, the introduction to awareness, natural liberation through naked perception. Translators a, a note. This chapter is the essence of the esoteric instruction by which the student is influenced to the ultimate, introduced rather, to the ultimate nature of mind. Prior to entering into this practice, which focuses directly on the nature of mind itself, this introduction should be received from an accomplished lineage holder. Then, 
whilst in solitary retreat, it is recommended that this text be read repeatedly as a guide between meditation sessions. And here begins the text. Herein is contained the introduction to awareness, natural liberation through naked perception, which is an extract from the peaceful and wrathful deities, a profound sacred teaching entitled Natural Liberation Through Recognition of Enlightened Intention. Homage to the deities embodying the three Buddha bodies who are the natural radiance of awareness. Here I shall present the teaching known as the Introduction to Awareness, Natural Liberation Through Naked Perception, which is an extract from the Peaceful and Wrathful Deities, a profound sacred teaching entitled Natural Liberation Through Recognition of Enlightened Intention. Thus shall I introduce to you the nature of intrinsic awareness. So contemplate it well, O fortunate child of Buddha nature. Samaya, agya, agya, agya. The importance of the introduction to awareness. Imaho, though the single nature of mind which completely pervades both cyclic existence and nirvana has been naturally present from the beginning, you have not recognized it. Even though its radiance and awareness have never been interrupted, you have not yet encountered its true face. Even though it arises unimpededly in every facet of existence, you have not as yet recognized the single nature of mind. In order that the single nature might be recognized by you, the conquerors of the three times have taught an inconceivably vast number of practices, including the 84,000 aspects of the sacred teachings. Yet, despite this diversity, not even one of these teachings has been given by the conquerors outside the context of an understanding of this nature. And even though there are inestimable volumes of sacred writings equally vast as the limits of space, actually, these teachings can be succinctly expressed in a few words, which are the introduction to awareness. Here is the direct face-to-face -face introduction to the enlightened intention of the conquerors. Here is the method for entering into actual reality in this very moment without reference to past or future events. The actual introduction to awareness. Kieho. O fortunate children, listen to these words. The term mind is commonplace and widely used, yet there are those who do not understand its meaning, those who falsely understand it, those who partially understand it, and those who have not yet uh, quite understood its genuine reality. Thus there has arisen an inconceivably vast number of assertions as to the nature of mind posited by the various philosophical systems. Further, since ordinary persons do not understand the meaning of the term mind and do not intuitively recognize its nature, they can con continue to roam through the six classes of sentient rebirth within three world systems and consequently experience suffering. This is the fault of not understanding this intrinsic nature of mind. Even though pious attendants and hermit Buddhas claim that they understand the single nature of mind as the partial absence of self, they do not understand it exactly as it is. Furthermore, being fettered by opinions held in accordance with their respective literatures and philosophical systems, there are those who do not perceive the inner radiance directly. The pious attendants and hermit Buddhas are obscured in this respect by their attachment to the subject-object dichotomy. The adherents of Madhyamaka are obscured by their attachment to the extremes of the two truths. The practitioners of Kriya Tantra and Yoga Tantra are obscured by their attachment to the extremes of ritual service and attainment. The practitioners of Maha Yoga and Anu Yoga are obscured by their attachment to the extremes of space and awareness. All these practitioners stray from the point because they polarize the non-dual reality, and since they fail to unify these extremes in non-duality, they do not attain Buddhahood. Thus, all of those beings continue to roam in cyclic existence because they persistently engage in forms of renunciation and in acts of rejection and acceptance with regard to their own minds, where, in reality, cyclic existence and nirvana are inseparable. Therefore, one should abandon all constructed teachings and all unnatural states free from activity. 
And by virtue of this introduction to awareness, natural liberation through naked perception, which is presented here, one should realize all beings in the context of this great natural liberation. So it is that all enlightened attributes are brought to completion within the great perfection. Samaya, Urgya, Urgya, Urgya. Synonyms for mind. As for this apparent and distinct phenomenon, which is called mind, in terms of existence, it has no inherent existence whatsoever. In terms of origination, it is the source of the divine, diverse joys and sorrows of cyclic existence and nirvana. In terms of philosophical opinion, it is subject to opinions in accordance with the eleven vehicles. In terms of designation, it has an inconceivable number of distinct names. Some call it the nature of mind, the nature of mind itself. Some eternalists give it the name self. Pious attendants call it selflessness of the individual. Chitra matrins call it mind. Some call it the perfection of discriminative awareness. Some call it the nucleus of the sugata. Some call it the great uh, vehicle, uh, the great seal, rather. Some call it the unique seminal point. Some call it the expanse of reality. Some call it the ground of all, and some call it ordinary, unfabricated consciousness. The three considerations. The following is the introduction to the means of experiencing this single nature of mind through the application of three considerations. First, recognize that past thoughts are traceless, clear, and empty. Second, recognize that future thoughts are unproduced and fresh. And third, recognize that the present moment abides naturally and unconstructed. When this ordinary momentary consciousness is examined nakedly and directly by oneself, upon examination it is a radiant awareness, which is free from the presence of an observer, manifestly stark and clear, completely empty and uncreated in all respects, lucid, without duality of radiance and emptiness, not permanent, for it is lacking inherent existence in all respects, not a mere nothingness, for it is radiant and clear, not a single entity, for it is clearly perceptible as a multiplicity, yet not existing inherently as a multiplicity, for it is indivisible and of a single savor. This intrinsic awareness, which is not extraneously derived, is itself the genuine introduction to the abiding nature of all things. For in this intrinsic awareness, the three Buddha bodies are inseparable and fully present as one. Its emptiness and utter lack of inherent existence is the Buddha body of reality. The natural resonance and radiance of this emptiness is the Buddha body of perfect resource. And its unimpeded arising in any form whatsoever is the Buddha body of emanation. These three, fully present as one, are the very essence of awareness itself. Consequences of the Introduction to Awareness when the introduction is powerfully applied in accordance with the above method for entering into this reality, one's own immediate consciousness is this very reality. Abiding in this reality, which is uncontrived and naturally radiant, how can one say that one does not understand the nature of mind? Abiding in this reality, wherein there is nothing on which to meditate, how can one say that by having entered into meditation one was not successful? abiding in this reality, which is one's actual awareness itself, how can one say that one could not find one's own mind? Abiding in this reality, the uninterrupted union of radiance and awareness, how can one say that the true face of mind has not been seen? Abiding in this reality, which is itself the cognizer, how can one say that those sought this cognizer could not be found? Abiding in this reality, where there is nothing at all to be done, how can one say that whatever one did, one did not succeed? Given that it is sufficient to leave this awareness as it is, uncontrived, how can one say that one could not continue to abide in that state? Given that it is sufficient to leave it as it is, without doing anything whatsoever, how can one say that one could not do just that? Given that, within this reality, radiance, awareness, and emptiness are inseparable and spontaneously present, how can one say that by having practiced one attained nothing? 
given that this reality is naturally originating and spontaneously present without causes or conditions, how can one say that by having made the effort to find it, one has, was incapable of success? Given that the arising and liberation of conceptual thoughts occur simultaneously, how can one say that by having applied this antidote to conceptual thoughts, one was not effective? Abiding in this immediate consciousness itself, how can one say that one does not know this reality? Observations related to examining the nature of mind. Be certain that the nature of mind is empty and without foundation. One's own mind is insubstantial, like an empty sky. Look at your own mind to see whether it is like that or not. Divorced from views which constructively determine the nature of emptiness, be certain that a pristine cognition naturally originating is primordially radiant. Just like the nucleus of the sun, which is itself naturally originating, look at your own mind to see whether it is like that or not. Be certain that this awareness which is pristine cognition is uninterrupted, like the coursing central torrent of a river which flows unceasingly. Look at your own mind to see whether it is like that or not. Be certain that conceptual thoughts and fleeting memories are not strictly identifiable, but insubstantial in their motion like the breezes of the atmosphere. Look at your own mind to see whether it is like the, this or not, like that or not. Be certain that all that appears is naturally manifest in the mind, like the images in a mirror which also appear naturally. Look at your own mind to see whether it is like that or not. Be certain that all characteristics are liberated right where they are, like the clouds of the atmosphere, naturally originating and naturally dissolving. Look at your own mind to see whether it is like that or not. There are no phenomena extraneous to those that originate from the mind. So how could there be anything on which to meditate apart from the mind? There are no phenomena extraneous to those that originate from the mind. So there are no modes of conduct to be undertaken extraneous to those that originate from the mind. There are no phenomena extraneous to those that originate from the mind. So there are no commitments to be kept extraneous to those that originate from the mind. There are no phenomena extraneous to those that originate from the mind. So there are no results to be attained extraneous to those that originate from the mind. There are no phenomena extraneous to those that originate from the mind. So one should observe one's own mind looking into its nature again and again. If upon looking outwards towards the external expanse of the sky there were no projections emanated by the mind, and if, on looking inwards at one's own mind, there is no projectionist who projects thoughts by thinking them, then one's own mind, completely free from conceptual projections, will become luminously clear. This intrinsic awareness, union of inner radiance and emptiness, is the Buddha body of reality, appearing like the illumining effect of a sunrise on a clear and cloudless sky. It is clearly knowable despite its lack of specific shape or form. There is a great distinction between those who understand and those who misunderstand this point. This naturally originating inner radiance, uncreated from the very beginning, is the parentless child of awareness. How amazing! It is the naturally originating pristine cognition, uncreated by anyone. How amazing! This radiant awareness has never been born and will never die. How amazing! Though manifestly radiant, it lacks an extraneous perceiver. How amazing! Though it has roamed throughout cyclic existence, it does not degenerate. How amazing! Though it has seen Buddhahood itself, it does not improve. How amazing! Though it is present in everyone, it remains unrecognized. How amazing! Still, one hopes for some attainment other than this. How amazing! Though it is present within oneself, one continues to seek it elsewhere. How amazing! Intrinsic awareness as view, meditation, conduct, and result. Ima, this immediate awareness, insubstantial and radiant, is itself the highest of all views. This non-referential, all-encompassing awareness, which is free in every respect, is itself the highest of all meditations.
This uncontrived activity based on awareness simply expressed in worldly terms is itself the highest of all types of conduct. This unsought attainment of awareness spontaneously present from the beginning is itself the highest of all results. Now the four great media which are errorless are presented. First, the great medium of errorless view it is this radiant immediate awareness. Since it is radiant and without error, it is called a medium. Second, the great medium of errorless meditation is this radiant immediate awareness. Since it is radiant and without error, it is called a medium. Third, the great medium of errorless conduct is this radiant immediate awareness. Since it is radiant and without error, it is called a medium. Fourth, the great medium of errorless result is this radiant immediate awareness. Since it is radiant and without error, it is called a medium. Now the four great nails which are unchanging are presented. First, the great nail of the unchanging view is this radiant immediate awareness. Since it is firm throughout the three times, it is called a nail. Second, the great nail of unchanging meditation is this radiant immediate awareness. Since, since it is firm throughout the three times, it is called a nail. Third, the great nail of unchanging conduct is this radiant immediate awareness. Since it is firm throughout the three times, it is called a nail. Fourth, the great nail of the unchanging result is this radiant immediate awareness. Since it is firm throughout the three times, it is called a nail. Now follows the esoteric instruction which reveals the three times to be one. Abandon your notions of the past without attributing a temporal sequence. Cut off your mental associations regarding the future without anticipation. Rest in a spacious modality without clinging to the thoughts of the present. Do not meditate at all since there is nothing upon which to meditate. Instead, revelation will come through undistracted mindfulness since there is nothing by which you can be distracted. Not nakedly observe all that arises in this modality, which is without meditation and without distraction. When this experience arises, intrinsically aware, naturally cognizant, naturally radiant and clear, it is called the mind of enlightenment. Since within this mind of enlightenment there is nothing upon which to meditate, this modality transcends all objects of knowledge, since within this mind of enlightenment there are no distractions, it is the radiance of the essence itself. This Buddha body of reality, union of radiance and emptiness, in which the duality of appearance and emptiness is naturally liberated, becomes manifest in this way, attained by the structured path to Buddhahood, and thus Vajrasattva is actually perceived at this moment. Now follows the instruction which brings one to the point where the six extreme perspectives are exhausted. Though there is a vast plethora of discordant views, within this intrinsic awareness or single nature of mind, which is the naturally originating pristine cognition, there is no duality between this object viewed and the observer. Without focusing on the view, search for the observer. Though one searches for this observer, none will be found. So, at that instant, one will be brought to the exhaustion point of the view. At that very moment, one will encounter the innermost boundary of the view. Since there is no object at all to be observed, and since one has not fallen into a primordial, vacuous emptiness, this, the lucid awareness which is now present is itself the view of the great perfection. Here there is no duality between realization and lack of realization. Though there is a vast plethora of discordant meditations within this intrinsic awareness which penetrates ordinary consciousness to the core, there is no duality between the object of meditation and the meditator. Without meditating on the object of meditation, search for the meditator. Though one searches for this meditator, none will be found. So, at that instant, one will be brought to the exhaustion point of meditation. At that very moment, one will encounter the innermost boundary of meditation. Since there is no object at all on which to meditate, and since one has not fallen under the sway of delusion, drowsiness, or agitation, the lucid, uncontrived awareness which is now present is itself the uncontrived, meditative equipoise or concentration. Here, there is no duality between abiding and non-abiding. Though there is a vast plethora of discordant modes of conduct, 
within this intrinsic awareness, which is the unique seminal point of pristine cognition, there is no duality between the action and the actor. Without focusing on the action, search for the actor. Though one searches for this actor, none will be found. So, at that instant, one will be brought to the exhaustion point of conduct. At that very moment, one will encounter the innermost boundary of conduct. Since from the beginning there has been no conduct to undertake, and since one has not fallen under the sway of bewildering propensities, the lucid uncontrived awareness which is now present is itself pure conduct without having to be contrived, modified, accepted, or rejected. Here there is no duality between purity and impurity. Though there is a vast plethora of discordant results within this intrinsic awareness, which is the true nature of mind, the spontaneous presence of the three Buddha bodies, there is no duality between the object of attainment and the attainer. Without focusing on the attainment of the result, search for the attainer. Though one searches for this attainer, none will be found. So at that instant, one will be brought to the exhaustion point of the result. At that very moment, one will encounter the innermost boundary of the result. Since whatever the projected result, there is nothing to be attained, and since one has not fallen under the sway of rejection and acceptance, of hope and doubt, the naturally radiant awareness which is now spontaneously present is the fully manifest realization of the three Buddha bodies within oneself. Here, there is the result, a temporal Buddhahood itself. Synonyms for awareness. This awareness, free from the eight extremes, such as eternalism and nihilism and so forth, is called the middle way, which does not fall into any extremes. It is called awareness because mindfulness is uninterrupted. It is given the name nucleus of the Tathagata because aware emptiness is naturally endowed with this nucleus of awareness. If one understands this truth, one reaches perfection in all respects, for which reason this awareness is also called the perfection of discriminative awareness. Furthermore, it is called the great seal because it transcends the intellect and is atemporally free from extremes. And further, it is called the ground of all, because this awareness is the ground of all joys and sorrows associated with cyclic existence and nirvana. The distinction between these being, the distinction between these being contingent on whether or not this awareness is realized. Further, this radiant and lucid awareness is itself referred to as ordinary consciousness on account of those periods when it abides in its natural state in an ordinary, non-exceptional way. Thus, however, many well-conceived and pleasant-sounding names are applied to this awareness. In reality, those who maintain that these names do not refer to this present conscious awareness, but to something else above and beyond it, resemble someone who has already found an elephant, but is out looking for its tracks elsewhere. Though one were to scan the entire external universe, searching for the nature of mind, one would not find it. Buddhahood cannot be attained other than through the mind. Not recognizing this, one does indeed search for the mind externally. Yet how can one find one's own mind when one looks for it elsewhere? This is like a fool, for example, who, when finding himself amidst a crowd of people, becomes mesmerized by the spectacle of the crowd and forgets himself. Then, no longer recognizing who he is, starts searching elsewhere for himself, continuously mistaking others for himself. Similarly, since one does not discern the abiding nature, which is the fundamental reality of all things, one is cast into cyclic existence, not knowing that appearances are to be identified with the mind. And, not discerning one's own mind to be Buddha, Nirvana becomes obscured. The apparent dichotomy between cyclic existence and nirvana is due to the dichotomy between ignorance and awareness, but there is in reality no temporal divide between these two, even by a single moment. Seeing the mind as extraneous to oneself is indeed bewildering, yet bewilderment and non-bewilderment are the single essence. Since there exists no intrinsic dichotomy in the mental continuum of sentient beings, the uncontrived nature of mind is liberated just by being left in its natural state. 
Yet, if you remain unaware that bewilderment originates in the mind, you will never understand the meaning of actual reality. So you should observe that which naturally arises and naturally originates within your own mind. First, observe the source from which these appearances initially originated. Second, observe the place in which they abide in the interim. And third, observe the place to which uh, they will finally go. Then, one will find that just as, for example, a pond-dwelling crow does not stray from its pond, even though it flies away from the pond, similarly, although appearances arise from the mind, they arise from the mind and subside into the mind of their own accord. This nature of mind, which is all-knowing, aware of everything, empty and radiant, is established to be the manifestly radiant and self-originating Christian cognition, present from the beginning, just like the sky, as an indivisible union of emptiness and radiance. This itself is actual reality. The indication that this is the actual reality is that all phenomenal existence is perceived in the single nature of one's own mind, and this nature of mind is aware and radiant. Therefore, recognize this nature to be like the sky. However, this example of the sky, though used to illustrate actual reality, is merely a symbol, a partial and provisional illustration. For the nature of mind is aware, empty and radiant in all respects, while the sky is without awareness, empty, inanimate and void. Therefore, the true understanding of the nature of mind is not illustrated by the metaphor of the sky. To achieve this understanding, let the mind remain in its own state, without distraction. The nature of appearances. Now, with regard to the diversity of relative appearances, they are all perishable, not one of them is genuinely existent. All phenomenal existence, all the things of cyclic existence and nirvana, are the discernible manifestations of the unique essential nature of one's own mind. This is known because whenever one's own mental continuum undergoes change, there will arise the discernible manifestation of an external change. Therefore, all things are the discernible manifestations of mind. For example, the six classes of living beings discern phenomenal appearances in their differing ways. Eternalistic extremists and others who are remote from the Buddhist perspective perceive appearances in terms of a dichotomy of eternalism and nihilism. And followers of the nine sequences of the vehicle perceive appearances in terms of their respective views and so forth. For as long as this diversity of appearances is being perceived and diversely elucidated, differences as to the nature of appearances are apprehended, and consequently bewilderment comes about through attachment to those respective views. Yet, even though all those appearances of which one is aware in one's own mind do arise as discernible manifestations, Buddhahood is present simply when they are not subjectively apprehended or grasped. Bewilderment does not come about on account of these appearances, but it does come about through their subjective apprehension. Thus, if the subjectively apprehending thoughts are known to be of the single nature of mind, they will be liberated of their own accord. All things that appear are manifestations of mind. The surrounding environment, which appears to be inanimate, that too is mind. The sentient life forms, which appear as the six classes of living beings, they too are mind. The joys of both the gods and humans of the higher existences which appear, they too are mind. The sorrows of the three lower existences which appear, they too are mind. The five poisons representing the dissonant mental states of ignorance which appear, they too are mind. The awareness that is self-originating pristine cognition which appears, it too is mind. The beneficial thoughts conducive to attainment of nirvana which appear, they too are mind. The obstacles of malevolent forces and spirits which appear, they too are mind. The deities and spiritual accomplishments which manifest exquisitely, they too are mind. The diverse kinds of pure vision which appear, they too are mind. The non-conceptual, one-pointed abiding and meditation which appears, it too is mind. The colors characteristic of objects which appear, they too are mind. The state without characteristics and without conceptual elaboration which appears, it too is mind. The non-duality of the single and the multiple which appears, it too is mind. 
the unprovability of existence and non-existence which appears, it too is mind. There are no appearances at all apart from those that originate in the mind. The unimpeded nature of mind assumes all manner of appearances. Yet, although these appearances arise, they are without duality, and they naturally subside into the modality of mind. Like waves in the waters of an ocean, whatever names are given to these unceasingly arising objects of designation, in actuality there is but one single nature of mind, and that single nature of mind is without foundation and without root. Therefore, it is not perceptible at all, in any direction whatsoever. It is not perceptible as substance, for it lacks inherent existence in all respects. It is not perceptible as emptiness, for it is the resonance of awareness and radiance. It is not perceptible as diversity, for it is the indivisibility of radiance and emptiness. This present intrinsic awareness is manifestly radiant and clear, and even though there exists no known means by which it can be fabricated, and even though this awareness is without inherent existence, it can be directly experienced. Thus, if it is experientially cultivated, all beings will be liberated. Conclusion All those of all differing potential, regardless of their acumen or dullness, may realize this intrinsic awareness. <coughs> However, for example, even though sesame is the source of oil and milk of butter, but there will be no extract if these are unpressed or unchurned, Similarly, even though all beings actually possess the seed of Buddhahood, sentient beings will not attain Buddhahood without experiential cultivation. Nonetheless, even a cowherd will attain liberation if he or she engages in experiential cultivation. For even the, although one may uh, not know how to elucidate the state intellectually, one will, through experiential cultivation, become manifestly established in it. One whose mouth has actually tasted molasses does not need others to explain its taste. But even learned scholars who have not realized the single nature of mind will remain the victims of bewilderment. For, however learned and knowledgeable in explaining the nine vehicles they may be, they will be like those who spread fabulous tales of remote places they have never seen, and as far as the attainment of Buddhahood is concerned, they will not approach it even for an instant. If this nature of intrinsic awareness is understood, virtuous and negative acts will be liberated right where they are. But if this single nature is not understood, one will amass nothing but future lives within cyclic existence, with its higher and lower realms, regardless of whether one has re engaged in virtuous or non-virtuous actions. Yet, if one's own mind is simply understood to be pristine cognition, utterly empty of inherent existence, the consequences of virtuous and negative actions will never come to fruition, for just as a spring cannot, realize, cannot materialize in empty space, within the realization of emptiness, virtuous and negative actions do not objectively exist. So it is that for the purpose of nakedly perceiving the manifestly present intrinsic awareness, this natural liberation through naked perception is most profound. Thus, by following this instruction, one should familiarize oneself with this intrinsic awareness. Profoundly sealed. Ima. This introduction to awareness, natural liberation through naked perception, has been composed for the sake of future generations, the sentient beings of a degenerate age. It integrates in a purposeful, concise abridgment all my preferred tantras, transmissions, and esoteric instructions. Though I have disseminated it at this present time, it will be concealed as a precious treasure. May it be encountered by those of the future who have a positive inheritance of past actions. Samaya Urgya, Urgya, Urgya. This treatise concerning the direct introduction to awareness, entitled Natural Liberation Through Naked Perception, was composed by Padmakara, the preceptor of Odayana. May its influence not be ended until a cyclic existence has been emptied. That concludes my reading of the first four chapters of the Bardo Todo, known in English as the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Before we open the floor to uh, discussion, 
I would like to conclude with a dedication of merit, whereby we dedicate the merit uh, generated by this uh, observance, by this reading, to all beings. Uh, you are welcome to join me. I will put the dedication of merit in the chat. Whatever understanding, whatever positive force has come from this, may it go deeper and deeper and act as a cause to reach enlightenment for the benefit of all. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present the Dharma. I am now closing my voice and the floor is open to chat and discussion.